Keep listening after the credits for a special presentation of our new sister show, Folklier. It's a very distinctive sound, isn't it? You'll know exactly when you've heard a whip by its distinctive cracking sound, which is why they call it a whip crack. Nothing else really sounds like it when it's done properly. And of course, we all know by now that the cracking sound is made by part of the whip moving faster than the speed of sound, causing a small sonic boom. But almost no one calls it a whip boom instead. Surprisingly, it took until 1958 to actually confirm that the noise was made by a sonic boom. Also, you'll probably have picked up by now the amazing bit of trivia that the whip, since it has existed for so long in human history that its true origins are lost somewhere in prehistory, was, without a doubt, the fastest man-made object to exist up until the late 19th and early 20th century, when the muzzle velocity of firearms finally exceeded the speed of sound. And then, of course, there's that trilogy. Yes, trilogy of films starring Harrison Ford as the world's least instructive archaeologist. Capable of almost anything, he employed a whip to get him out of jam after jam and inspired a generation of moviegoers to take up the whip, and then put it down again just as quickly when it turned out to be more Cross of Coronado action than Last Ark of the Covenant. Oh, and we dare to say that at three gold pieces and one D4 slashing damage, the whip is not the first weapon of choice among your standard Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition crowd. Not only that, but it's also hard to optimize for without some special shenanigans, so the min-maxers tend to leave it alone. All in all, probably the least used basic weapon in the game. If you're really up on your specialist whip knowledge and be mindful there are children present, You'll know names like Bullwhip and Cat of Nine Tails, and maybe even have an inkling about the self flagellating monks of yore. But we reckon that's about where whip knowledge stops for most people. Maybe you're happy with that. Maybe that's all you need to know. Maybe your curiosity is satisfied. But not ours. See, the problem is, whips are, like many, many things we've covered over the years, about much more than you'll find in the movies and in your light reading. Their uses are as varied as their forms, and there's a whole world of whips out there to get your teeth into if you so choose. So what we propose is this. If you can prevent yourself from cracking wise about whips and their more esoteric uses, we promise to fill your ears with more information than you knew was available about whips, so that in turn, you can surprise not only your dinner guests, but also your players, by whipping out your newfound knowledge of the myriad ways whips have been made, developed, and used over the long centuries of their existence. And, if you can agree to that, we can get cracking. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. It's all about sheep again. Well, Technically, it's about all livestock everywhere, but we're going to use sheep as our example once again. So bear with us. See, the reason we need the sheep is, if we're going to talk about the history and usage of the whip, we need to talk about why it came into use in the first place, and why that happened so far back in time that no one thought to write it down. Again. Which is, of course, because no one really knew how to write that far back. Picture, if you will, a primitive example of early humans. In the period we're interested in, they've pretty well got the hang of animal husbandry, if not exactly on a grand scale. They've worked out that the more livestock you have, the more secure you are in terms of food and material. But what they haven't quite worked out is how to control a large number of animals all in one go. You can just about wrangle three or so sheep with relatively few problems. But too many more than that, and all of a sudden you're constantly chasing sheep all over the countryside as first one group and then another gets confused about what it is you want them to do, say move into a little stone pen, and how you want them to do it. And sure, when it comes to sheep, mankind learned to work with dogs and each other in order to kind of keep the flocks under control and moving in the right direction. Fair enough. But in other places and at other times, other solutions were needed. 
it might not have been possible to get everyone together to move the sheep up the road to the next pasture, or it might have been difficult to train dogs. And remember, these example sheep are just that, an example, standing in for all livestock everywhere. So with a particular set of livestock-based creatures, you needed a handy way to move them about as at least a partially semi-organized group. Some way to keep some of them from running off in one direction and others of them from running off in the other direction at the same time. It's a lot of work for one person to keep all the herds, flocks, and other collective nouns all together and, importantly, safe. Now, the thing to know about this problem is that different places came up with different solutions, but crucially, they were all very similar and could all come under the classification of a whip. And you'll have seen most of the solutions in the present day, but probably you didn't know they were all essentially whips. The idea is that by waving something around in the air with a certain amount of specific intent, you can make it make a noise, either by striking something with it, or simply because the motion induces a noise by virtue of the speed at which it moves. Of course, it is unpleasant to be struck with a whip of any sort, and here, remember our agreement. So the earliest forms of whips were used to strike animals in order to get them to comply with your intent. If you want a sheep to move to the left, strike it on the right, and it will sure enough move away from the side on which it was struck. Horse being a bit slow, whip it in the rear to encourage it forward. And yes, to our modern sensibilities, striking an animal with a whip is considered an act of cruelty. But even back in the earliest days, it probably wouldn't have taken very long to realize that really hitting anything hard enough to physically hurt it was a bad idea, if for no other reason than that you now had damaged goods. And you certainly would have a rather ticked-off animal, very unwilling to be around you and do what you wanted. Once people worked out how to crack a whip, which, remember, involves making a very loud supersonic noise, it became apparent that the noise was sufficient to get an animal moving. You didn't and don't actually have to strike it. You just need to make the noise in a location that you want the animal to move away from, and they will. And the longer you make the traditional whip, the more reach you had, and therefore were able to control a larger group of animals. But that considers only the most familiar type of whip, those made of long strands of leather woven together to form a stiff handle with a long, flexible lead. Other types of whips also exist. For example, the riding crop is a type of whip. Sure, it doesn't look like you expect a whip to look, but it fulfills the same function and even retains the flexible bit attached to a stiff handle. In this case, the flexible bit is called the popper, and it's just a little looped flap of leather on the end of a two or three foot long rod called a stock. Mostly they see use around horses. By tapping the horse with the flexible end at various locations, the rider or jockey can encourage the horse to move towards or away from things at a faster or slower rate. And these days, there are very strict rules in competitions where crops see use, like barrel racing or show jumping, that dictate just how much crop a rider is allowed to use and how it is allowed to be applied. These days, of course, the whip is used as both a visual and audio cue, generally to provide directional guidance. Think of it like an extension of the arm and a finger snap that can be seen and heard at greater distances. But depending on the type of whip, there are exceptions. Stock whips, which include both the familiar Indiana Jones bullwhip and Australian stock whips, are usually made out of stout leather with a relatively short handle compared to the overall length of the whip and a very long tail. These are the sort that produce the definitive cracking noise, except it isn't exactly the whip that really makes the noise. It's an extra length of cord or string at the end that provides the really distinctive snap we associate with whips. Again, depending on the exact type and the needs of the user, stock whips can be anywhere from 4 to over 20 feet long. The main difference between the Australian stock whip and a bullwhip is that the main lash connects directly to the handle on a bullwhip instead of at a joint in the Australian version. They both share the same basic components, though. A handle, either exposed or wrapped in leather, a long braided lash called a thong ending in a short, thinner piece of leather called the fall, with a cracker or popper attached to that. Other versions of the stock whip include a shorter, stouter whip called a cattle drafter or drafting whip, 
which is a two to two and a half foot rod with a 12 inch long thong used to strike the ground and move cattle and pigs, as well as several variations on cow whips for use in tight, narrow conditions where a full swing isn't possible. Signal whips and snake whips are usually comprised of a single tail or thong and are often used with sled dog teams and as a sort of pocket whip in cattle yards. Rather than having a handle of wood or similar material, they tend toward less rigid handles, often made around lead shot. This allows the whip to be coiled up into a smaller space for carrying in a pocket or storage where space is a premium. A signal whip is usually made without a fall, unlike the snake whip. And those are just the main types of whips you'd see in use around livestock. There's a whole other world of whips that use specifically in the equestrian world. From the dressage whip used by the rider to tap on a horse's hindquarters to ask for more speed while still maintaining both hands on the reins, to longe whips used in horse training to indicate direction and speed around a circle while the trainer stands in the middle, to a variety of canes and sticks with bits of leather attached, like riding crops with their little loop of leather, and the quirt, a flexible leather rod with two wide pieces of leather used to make a loud cracking noise used more often by riders to keep other animals, such as cows, away from the rider and horse. But while the bullwhip and its kin are more likely to turn up at your game table than the riding crop or quirt, there are still a few other types of whips which, in the right circumstances, might be more interesting to put into use. And remember, we agreed to behave ourselves. Unfortunately, many of these other whips have been put to use not on or around animals, but on people. We as a species tend to find ways to inflict pain and injury on one another, but it pays to remember that it is us who do it. You can't really blame the tool for the use it is put to. And as always, it may not be right, it may not be fair, but it happened. A cat of nine tails is a nine-tailed flail used by the British Army and Royal Navy as a form of physical punishment to keep the troops in line. Probably it was called a cat of nine tails because of the distinctive claw-like marks it leaves on the body. There are nine two and a half foot long knotted cotton cords connected by a thick cotton handle. Usually, at least in the Navy, it was made out of rope thicker than a man's wrist, which was cut off at a five foot length and then unraveled sufficiently to make the cords. Each cord would be knotted along its length. Sailors could be whipped for any number of infractions. On board a ship, the captain was the law, and breaking any of the written or unwritten rules of a given captain's ship could result in corporal punishment. Drunkenness on duty or off, dereliction of duty, or striking an officer might all result in as many as twelve lashes from the cat, which, given the more serious punishments on hand, might have been getting off lucky. Records show that following formal court-martial, some sailors received punishments ranging from 200 lashes for desertion up to 500 for theft. One court-martial in the 18th century shows that one man was sentenced to 1,000 lashes, a punishment as good as a death sentence. His offense? Sodomy. Fortunately, if you were a young offender, you got off lightly. Oh, you'd get the same number of lashes, sure, but you only got the five-tailed cat, and rather than taking them on the back as an adult did, you were lashed on the bottom instead. Which was, of course, fine and normal and proper in that day and age. At least you weren't being flogged around the fleet. A man convicted of sedition or mutiny might be sentenced to an extraordinary number of lashes to be carried out a little at a time on every ship of the fleet, under the supervision of a doctor who determined when a particular flogging had been enough, the sailor's sentence could sometimes take months to carry out, depending on where every element of the fleet was located. It was generally considered that anywhere from 250 to 500 lashes were enough to kill a man as infection would spread between the wounds, so naturally steps were taken to prevent the offender from dying before his sentence was completed. Once sufficiently flogged on a given ship, the wounds would be bathed in seawater or brine, literally rubbing salt into the wounds, which is where that expression comes from. Cat o' nine tails were used in the Navy, the Army, in prisons even into the 20th century, 
and in colonial Australia, when it was still a penal colony, when each cord had a lead weight added to the end of it, just to make sure the offender didn't offend again. In South Africa, three to five foot long flexible whip-like rods were made by using hippopotamus or rhino hide. Originally intended for use on tough, thick-skinned oxen, the jambok soon found use by the South African police force against rioters and protesters during the apartheid era, though it has also been used as a judiciary punishment well before that. And the less said about the scourge and its related cousin the knot, the better. Both were whips which incorporated as part of their design bones, metal, stones, or other hard objects at the end of the thongs so as to better remove the flesh from the victim's back. A popular punishment choice for those, from Roman governors to slave owners, wishing to permanently mark someone as an example of their authority. But even with all that, a whip is a difficult weapon to use in combat anywhere beyond the game table, which is not to say there are those who don't. The Mangarai people of Indonesia practice both whip fighting as a ceremonial exercise and whip boxing as a sport. And in the Philippines, Latigo Idaga was formalized as a martial art focusing on flexible weapons like the whip in 1987. But perhaps the most impressive use of the whip as a weapon is the Arumi. Imagine a sword with a blade so thin and flexible that it has very little actual rigidity. It just sort of flops over when not in motion. Then imagine one in each hand. And further, imagine that each sword is actually made up of multiple such blades, and all of it is controlled by someone dancing and twirling around in a complicated motion designed to keep the blades moving at all times and creating an almost impenetrable barrier around them. And it's all razor sharp. It's the very last thing taught in the Indian martial art called Kalaripayatu, because you have to know and understand literally every other weapon to be effective with an Arumi. Look it up on YouTube. It's very impressive. And you won't find that in your player's handbook. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. But stay tuned and listen to the first episode of our new show, Folk Liar. We think you'll like it just as much as you like GM Word of the Week, but for completely different reasons. Stick around. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who is really excited for you to hear the new show. Music is provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Why not whip the teacher when the pupil misbehaves? And now. Hello, and welcome to Folk Liar. I'm the chief liar, Brian. I'm going to tell you a lie, but I'm also going to tell you two authentic stories from folklore. If you can tell which is which, you could win a luxurious mug. All you have to do is listen to each of the stories and then email your best guess to liar at folkliar.com. To make things trickier, I rewrite each of the tales on offer in my own particular style. All the details are the same as the authentic tales, except for the lie, of course. If you know your folklore, it should be easy to tell. If you don't, sit back, enjoy the stories, and have a guess anyway. You'll have five days from the date of the episode release to send in your guess, at which point a winner will be drawn from among all the correct guesses and announced on the next episode, along with the reveal. Speaking of reveals, if you listen to the trailer for the show, you might be pleased to know that the story of the rats was, indeed, an entirely authentic Japanese endless story. No winners were drawn, but now you know. Let's begin with a threesome of folktales under the incredibly appropriate heading of Telling Stories. The first comes from Germany, and features a man who is often caught in his lies and the solution he came up with to fix it all. But don't take my word for it. There was once a rich and powerful nobleman who lived a normally quiet, 
pleasant life, except that he liked to tell awful lies and frequently got caught. It was very embarrassing, not the telling of lies, mind you, but the getting caught, which is what people are mostly embarrassed about. One day, the nobleman decided that the thing to do was to hire a servant to help him out, someone who could get the nobleman out of trouble when the time came. Then the nobleman wouldn't get caught in a lie and wouldn't have to be embarrassed. So he advertised for the position and waited. Shortly thereafter, a man arrived and offered his services. He seemed a good enough fellow. He dressed the part and certainly talked the part. And when the nobleman explained that he wanted the man to be able to lie, the prospective servant said, Well, if that's what I have to do, then that's what I have to do. It is, said the nobleman. I tell the most terrible lies, and it's embarrassing getting caught in them. I want you to help get me out of it. And to this the servant agreed, and so was hired on the spot. A few days later, the nobleman went out to an inn and took his new servant with him. After a few rounds of drinks and some good company, the nobleman told his first lie of the evening. Once I was hunting, the nobleman said, and I shot three rabbits in the air at once. Well, that's just not possible, said the people listening. We don't believe you. Then you'd better get my coachman in here. He saw the whole thing and he'll vouch for me. So they went out and got his coachman, who was, of course, the specially hired servant. Johan, said the nobleman, piling up the lies while he could, since his servant was neither the coachman nor called Johan. I've just been telling these people about the three rabbits I shot in the air all at once the other day, and they don't believe me. Can you imagine? Tell them how it was. Very well, sir, said not Johan, a name he didn't particularly like and paused as if recalling the circumstances. We were in the upper meadow last Wednesday when a rabbit came jumping out of a hedge. Just as it reached the pinnacle of its jump, you shot it dead. But that's only one rabbit, complained the listeners. You said three. And most of them looked very disagreeable indeed. Yes, said Jack, as his name probably was, but when we skinned it and gutted it, we found two young rabbits inside. She had been pregnant, you see. Well, of course, this shut everyone up entirely, and there was no more argument to be had. On the ride home, the nobleman turned to his new servant and said, You did very well. Even I was impressed. Yes, sir, replied, as it were, Johan. But the next time you tell lies, if you could just keep things out of the air... That would be fine. On firm ground, it will be much easier for me to help you. Our next story is from Norway, or so I claim, and is about a man, a godly man, who thinks he is far more important than he is. Once there was a parson. Now, parsons are supposed to be amiable older people who spend most of their time tending to the needs of their flock in their assigned parish. But not this parson. No, this parson thought he was very important. In fact, he often thought he was the most important person around and would ride around shouting at people. As soon as he saw anyone on the road ahead of him, he would start in. Off the road! Off the road! Here comes the parson himself! Get off the road! and carry on doing that until the other party moved aside and made room for him to go by. Well, that's all well and good when you're riding around in a parish mostly by yourself. People tend to get out of the way of a screaming man on a horse in any case, parson or not. But it doesn't tend to work very well when the king is in town, which, on this particular day, he was. Off the road! Off the road! The parson kept shouting, even though he could barely see the king in the distance. Certainly not well enough to tell he was the king. And certainly the king wasn't going to move aside, even if the parson did keep shouting. So the king just kept driving straight ahead, paying no mind to the shouty man on the horse. Well, eventually they got close enough to each other for the parson to see who it was he'd been shouting at that wouldn't move aside. 
and you better believe he shut right up and got off the road when he realized it was the king. Too little, too late though. As the king passed by the parson, he leaned over and said, Tomorrow you will come to the court, and if you can't answer the three questions I shall put to you there, you shall lose both frock and collar for the sake of your pride. Well, the parson knew he was in trouble. See, he was very good at shouting and yelling and making a right spectacle of himself in other ways, too. So much so that it was practically the only thing he really did know how to do at all well. So a question and answer session with anyone, especially the king, was way out of his league. He knew he couldn't hack it, never having had to give an answer for himself to anyone before. Fortunately, he knew the sexton. And since the sexton was responsible for actually taking care of the church rather than just riding around yelling at people, he had a fairly good head on his shoulders. Do you know, said the parson to the sexton, I'm not at all keen on going to see the king. Seems like a big waste of time. Any fool can ask more questions than ten wise men can answer. Tell you what, why don't you go in my place? Seems exactly like your sort of thing. Take these. Good day. And before the sexton could object or ask for an explanation, he found himself on the outside of a door he had started on the inside of, holding the parson's frock and rough collar. So off the sexton went, dressed in the parson's clothes, not entirely certain what had just happened to him. Still in all, he had a duty to the church, so perhaps it was all right. When the sexton arrived at the royal manor, he found the king awaiting him on the royal front porch, wearing his crown and scepter and looking for all the world like the kingliest king anyone had ever seen. "'So you're here, are you?' asked the king. And indeed, the sexton was there, right in front of him. "'Now tell me first, said the king, "'how far is it from east to west?' The sexton thought a moment and then said, "'That's a day's journey, that is.' "'How so?' asked the king. "'Well, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west "'and does it quite nicely in a day,' replied the sexton. "'Very well. Now tell me, what do you think I'm worth, "'just as you see me here?' asked the king "'and puffed out his chest just a bit. "'The sexton considered for a while and then said, I'm taught that Christ himself was valued at 30 pieces of silver, so I'd better not go any higher than, say, 29. Aha, yes, I see. Closing his eyes, the king concentrated a moment and then opened them. Well, since you're so wise by all accounts, tell me what I'm thinking now. Probably you think you've been talking to the parson all this time, but I'm sorry to tell you you're wrong, for he sent the sexton in his place. The king, quite astonished, blurted out, Aha! and then composed himself. Go home and tell the parson I've decided you should be the parson and he should be the sexton, and it will serve him right. And so it was, and it did serve him right. And finally, an English tale in which it is shown that finding the right bait is essential. Once, a woman sent her husband down to the sea to fish. She sent him out to fish because the cupboard at home was bare, and she didn't particularly feel like going down to the market itself. She'd been up all night mending socks, which was fair enough. The man went through an awful lot of socks, and it was very time-consuming to darn them all up again. So she sent him off to do the fishing while she stayed at home resting. When he arrived at the edge of the sea, he discovered he'd left his can of bait sitting at home on the table, which was no doubt going to get him into further trouble later. Since he didn't want to walk all the way home and back again and put more holes in his socks for his wife to mend, he started looking around for something he could use to convince a fish to bite his hook. The first thing he found was a juicy, fat grasshopper. He scooped it up in his hat and looked down on it. Mr. Grasshopper, said he, how would you like to dance and shimmy and entertain the fishes? 
But the grasshopper was uninterested in dancing and shimmying and entertaining the fishes and, sensing a trick, he hopped out of the hat and away down the shore. The next thing the man found was a shiny black cricket. He scooped it up in his hat and looked down on it. Mr. Cricket, he said, how would you like to dance and shimmy and entertain the fishes? But the cricket was uninterested in dancing and shimmying and entertaining the fishes, and, sensing a trick, he hopped out of the hat and away down the shore. Finally, after looking around for quite some time for something else suitable to put on a hook and entice fish with, the man found a wriggly, long earthworm under a rotted old log. He scooped it up in his hat and looked down on it. Mr. Earthworm, he said, how would you like to dance and shimmy and entertain the fishes. But the earthworm couldn't hop away out of the hat and down the shore, and instead sat there dancing and shimmying in the bottom of the hat, which the man took to mean yes, and having found exactly the right bait, had fish for dinner that night, and nice neat socks for his feet in the morning. Well, that was an excellent first effort, but what did you think? Which of these three tales was the fake? Tale number one about the noble liar? Tale number two, the self-important parson? Or tale number three about the fisherman and the bait? Send your guess to liar at folkliar.com, and if it's correct, you'll be entered to win our luxurious mug. Don't waste time, though. You've only got five days from the time this episode first released. Make sure to indicate the episode title and release date in your response. Folkliar is a production of Fiddleback Productions and is researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Our website is folkliar.com. If you'd like to help support the show and keep more episodes coming, head over there and click the generosity link at the top of the page. You can use Buy Me a Coffee to make a one-time donation or to sign up for a monthly membership to the show. Members will get access to transcripts, early episode releases, and more. Once again, that's the generosity link at folkliar.com to get started. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Our luxurious mug prize is awarded by Random Draw from among all correct entries. Entries are due no later than five days after the episode is first published. One entry per person, please. <laughs>